well, probably to many of you, this will come a surprise. Depending on, on the people who put all this information together, historical information that keeps track of all the wars and confrontations this country since 1776 have been involved in. I'm not even counting ones before 1776. Depending who you want to believe, it's been somewhere between 100 and 105. 100 and 105. I bet there's some teachers out there I have many teachers watching me that probably haven't even realized all the confrontations this country has been involved in. I'm just going to read you some. I'm going to read you many of them. I'll just quickly go through the list. Uh, obviously, everyone knows about the American Revolutionary War. And by the way, most of these, 98% of all these wars were well, put it this way, 98% of all these wars, the United States of America had victory. American Revolutionary War, everybody learns that in school. How about the Chickamauga War? from 1776 to 1795. The location of that war was in the Old Southwest. And that was a war with the Cherokee Indians. How about the Northwest Indian War from 1785 to 1793? That was located in Northwest Territory of this United States of America. Everybody's probably heard of this, the Whiskey Rebellion. It was a war between 1791 and 1794. Well, not all these are wars. That's why I expanded it out to official, declared, or non-declared wars. War is war, my friend, no matter how you look at it. Someone dies and there's a confrontation and battles taking place, that's war. How about the Quasi-War, 1798 to 1800? That was a two-year war. It's some connected part of the French Revolutionary Wars, but it mostly took place in the Atlantic Ocean, the Caribbean, the Indian Ocean, and the Mediterranean. So it was a widespread war. How about the First Barbary War from 1881 I mean, excuse me, 1801 to 1805. How about the Tecumseh War? I think that's how you say it. That was in the Northwest River, Ohio War, I mean, area. Everyone's probably heard of the War of 1812, from 1812 to 1815. The famous Battle of New Orleans. The Creek War from 1813 to 1814 in the southern United States. The Second Barbary War from uh, just 1815. First Seminole War, obviously in Florida, 1817 to 1818. The Texas Indian Wars from 1820 to 1875. There's even drawings of that war depicting the battles of that war between the Indians and this country. The Aracara War along the Missouri River in 1823, the agency anti-piracy operations <coughs> from 1825 to 1828, the Winnebago War, 
which covered areas of Illinois and Michigan Territory. The first Sumatran expedition skirmishes. Once again, you see the U.S. infantry assaulting forts at Kalua Batu in 1832. The Black Hawk War in 1832, the Second Seminole War in obviously Florida, 1835 to 1842, the Second Sumatran Expedition, 1838, the Mexican-American War, 1846 to 1848, the Cayuse War from 1847 to 1855, seven-year war, or eight-year war, that was in Oregon. The Apache's Wars, Apache Wars from 1851 to 1900, southwestern United States. The Puget Sound War from 1855 to 1856, located in Washington. The first Fiji Expedition, 1855. The Rogue Rivers War from 1855 to 1856. The Third Seminole War from 1855 to 1858. The Yakami, the Yakamai War, once again from 1855 to 1858 in Washington Territory. The Second Opium War, <laughs> that's right. That's where the British Empire, this country, and the French were involved together. And that location of that war took place in China. It's called the Second Opium War in 1856 to 1859. The Utah War in 1857 to 1858. Navajo Wars from 1858 to 1866 in New Mexico. The Second Fiji Expedition, 1859. The First and Second Cortina War, 1859 to 1861. That's in Texas and Mexico that took place. The Paiute War, 1860. That's around Pyramid Lake, Nevada. The Reform War in Mexico, 1860. Now everyone knows about this one, the American Civil War. From 1861 to 1865. Brother against brother there. The bombardment of the Key Nayuan. By the way, that was in 1861. That was the first time we got involved in Vietnam. And that was only back in 1861. The Yavapai Wars, located in Arizona, the 18 lasted. 1861 to 1875, the Dakota Wars of 1862, the Colorado War of 1863 to 1865, I don't know how to say this, but I'll give it a try, the Shimonsky War, 1863 to 1864, the Snake War of 1864 to 1868, that's Oregon, Nevada, California, Idaho areas. A lot of these are wars with Indians that took place. Some of them lasted over 50 years in some cases. Powder River War in 1865, the Red Cloud War in 1868 to 1868. The Siege of Mexico City in 1867. That's when the Mexican Republicans in the United States sieged Mexico City for a very short amount of time. Formosa Expedition in 1867, that was in southern Formosa. The Comanche ca Campaign in 1867 to 1875 throughout the western United States. The United States Expedition to Korea, the first time I got involved in the Koreans, with the Koreans in 1871. The Modoc War from 1872 to 1873, I'm probably boring you, but I'm going to prove a point. Red River War, 1874 to 1875. Las Cuevas War, 1875. The Great Sioux War of 1876 to 1877. Buffalo Hunters War, 1876 to 1877. The Nez Pierce War, located throughout Oregon, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, 1877. The San Lazario Salt War, in 1877 to 1878, the location in Texas. The Bannock War. 1878, Idaho, Oregon, and Wyoming. Cheyenne War, 1878 to 1879. The Sheepeter Indian War, 1879 in Idaho. The Victoria's 
Victorio's War, 1879 to 1881. The White River War, 1879 to 1880. The Pine Ridge Campaign, 1890 to 1891 in South Dakota. You can find on the internet mass graves for that war, the Pine Ridge Campaign. which happened shortly after the Wounded Knee Creek skirmish. The Garza Revolution, 1891 to 1893, Texas and Mexico. The, Revol the Revolution de Armana, that's our war from 1893 to 1894, and the location was Brazil, where the United States teamed up the first Brazilian Republic against the Brazilian mutineers. The Yaqui Wars in Arizona, Mexico, 1896 to 1918. Second Samoan Civil War, obviously in Samoa. Spanish-American War, 1898. The Philippine-American War, 1899 and 1902. The Moral Rebellion in 1899 and 1913, and that's also in the Philippines. Boxer Rebellion, 1899 to 1901. Of course, once again located in China. The Crazy Snake Rebellion, locations Oklahoma, 1909, took many prisoners of war, Indians as prisoners of war. The Border War, 1910 to 1919, it was kind of part of the, American, the, the Mexican Revolution. The Negro Rebellion of 1912, part of the Banana Wars in Cuba. The Occupation of Nicaragua, which also was part of the Battle Wars in 19, from 1912 to 1933. The Bluff War from 1914 to 1915. Location in Utah, Colorado. The occupation of Haiti, which also was part of the Banana Wars from 1915 to 1934. Sugar Intervention, Intervention, 1916 to 1918, which is also part of the Banana Wars location in Cuba. Occupation of the Dominican Republic, part of the Banana Wars from 1916 to 1924. Obviously, 1917 to 1918, World War I. And then our involvement also with many other countries, the Russian Civil War in 1918 and 1920, located between, I mean, located in the areas of Russia, Mongolia, and Iran. The Posey War of 1923 in Utah, World War II. 1941-1945, the Korean War 1950-1953, the Libyan Crisis in 1958, the Bay of Pigs invasion of 1961 in Cuba, the Simba Rebellion 1964, and that was located in Congo, Republic of Congo, Dominican Civil War from 1965 to 1966, I mean, you can look up some of these things. You can see all the pictures from it, troops and military equipment that were involved in these wars. The Minion Civil War, the closer you get to our time, the more information, obviously, the more photographs and scenes from the battlefront could be viewed. Because I'm sure some of you are probably shocked of all throughout this country's history, the confrontations we've been in, not just in this country, but worldwide. Obviously, the Vietnam War, 1965 to 1973, communist insurgency in Thailand. Most people don't realize we're there from 1965 to 19. 83. The Shabbat II, which is located in Zaire, Zaire, which was or which is the present day Republic of Congo, 1978. The multinational force Lebanon from 82 to 84. Invasion of Grenada, 1983. The Tanker War of 1987 and 1988. 
located in the Persian War, the invasion of Panama, 89 to 1990, the Gulf War from 1990 to 1991, the Somali Civil War from 1992 to 1995. I mean, there you can see a whole bunch of pictures of American patrols, soldiers patrolling Somalia. Didn't get much coverage. Intervention in Haiti of 1994-1995, the Bosnian War, 1994-1995, the Kosovo War, 1998-1999. You get the idea that we've been involved in a lot of confrontations. War in Afghanistan, Afghanistan 2001, supposedly it was ended in 2014. The Iraq War from 2003 to 2011. The war in Northwest Pakistan, which was part of the war on terror from 2004 to present. The 2011 military intervention in Libya. Many of you remember the U.S. vessels launching missiles from the sea. War on ISIL. Well, that's present. Now, the second war in Afghanistan that nobody seems to be talking about, nobody even covers anymore, that's presently going on. Well, you get the idea. No more of this. I've said for many, many years now, Ephraim is the United States of America. It was a war like tribe from its inception. You go to Isaiah 18. which I started to preach on several years back, but didn't get very far. I'll get back to it. Verse 1, it reads, Woe to the land, shouting with wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, or Cush, that sent ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bulrushes upon the water, saying, Go ye swift messengers to a nation scattered and peeled, to a people terrible from their beginning. Another translation could appear that struck, strikes fear from their beginning. A people that will make you feel in awe. Or a people terrible from their beginning. And I told you this, this is the United States of America. I'm sure it's in the video portions section, visual, video portion section of the last day series. It's not been written format yet, and it shouldn't be, because I'm not done with this chapter. So if you want to review what I did cover concerning the first few verses of this chapter, go ahead and check the archives out. But a people terrible from its beginning, a warlike tribe, And I've made it very clear that these United States of America are the tribe, or is the tribe, or was the tribe, and still is, just call something different now. Ephraim, not Manasseh, like many British early rights try to convince you that the United States of America is Manasseh. No, it's not. It's Ephraim terrible people from its beginning. And it's not. And I know it's going to really hit a nerve with some of you. And it's not a Christian nation. 
Does it have Christians? Obviously. Is it a Christian nation? Yeah, if you want to call it that, but in name only. In name only, like there's Christians in name only. But not true disciples of Jesus Christ. If anything, I'll call this country what God called it. You go to Hosea, chapter 1, you don't have to go there, I'm just going to read one verse. Verse 10. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people. Remember, God divorced them. He allowed them to take, be taken into bondage by the Assyrian Empire. And it shall, shall, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was, it, where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, well, there's an added by the translator, it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. These United States are the sons of the living God. A people terrible from its beginning. And we are the sons of the living God, but not because we say that we are Christian, a Christian nation. There's nothing that this nation can do to put us in the place God said He would put us in. Part of the lost tribes of Israel by, eventually we know what Christ said when He came, I came for the lost house of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He came to save them. Christ and what he did, besides for you as an individual, saved the lost house of Israel, the sheep of the lost house of Israel. It has a lot of individual application, but it also has a nationalistic application. Because of the work of Jesus Christ and what he did. This nation and all the lost tribes of Israel have the opportunity once again to not be divorced from God, but once again be called the sons of the living God. God. You think God really gave a damn or gives a damn about calling this United States of America or any other nation Christian? A Christian nation, we have to get back to our roots? You think about it. Think about it. The conservative right and its politicians running for president right now, at least one of them that's still in the race, main objective, whether you realize it or not, is to make this a Christian nation. Again. It never was. It was a nation that's been given the privilege and honor once again to be called the sons of the living God because we're not divorced as a nation. I'm not talking about the individual application here, so don't confuse the two because some of you are so legalistic, you'll do, you'll do that. Who cares less. Don't tell me we're a Christian nation and we need to get back to our values. We need to get back to some pollution of 
what you call the Mosaic Law <clears throat> and the Ten Commandments and wipe out everything that Christ has done for us as he said that he would do when he came to rescue sheep from the lost house of Israel. Which a lot of those, that sheep is planted right here in the United States. In our present day population. Why do you think I read you all those wars? Get back to what? To fighting? To killing? To shed blood? I read you all these wars so you could see for yourself. And this is just one example that I've pulled. That if we're, we're a Christian nation, we are sure bad ambassadors if that's what the definition of Christian, the way most of these hypocrites have defined it as. We sure don't love one another. What was Jesus' commandment? Love God and love one another. The greatest of all the commandments. Well, thank God it's not up to us. Thank God for His mercy. Us as individuals and for the nation of Ephraim, these United States of America that God will use. Oh, Bill, he'll uh, discipline this nation in the ways it needs to be disciplined. But it ain't going to be coming through politicians. It isn't becoming, uh, discipline is not going to be coming through politicians. They're snakes. They're vipers. They're poisonous. I don't know if I have it here. Let me read you something. Listen, you look at the politics of today, the election for president. We don't even go about, this. We don't, I won't even get into the Senate seats and House of Representatives and governorships that are up for grabs this election period. Let's just talk about the president. You got the liberal left. You got, I don't care what anybody tells me, the more I research Bernie Sanders, the more I'm convinced he's a communist. That describes himself as a socialist, a democratic socialist, because he's afraid to say communist because that will turn off too many people. Hillary's Hillary, everybody knows what Hillary's like. Trump is Trump. You kind of could guess what you can expect from him. Rubio's an established Republican that's just a puppet of the Republican Party, same as Keish. But the most dangerous, the most dangerous candidate out there. And the reason I say the most dangerous because it has religious application is Ted Cruz. Sure, he says things constitutionally, that turns on people, and some of the things he says is okay. No argument with that. But there's an agenda behind it to once again make this a Christian nation. It's part of the dominion theology that runs loose out there, or the kingdom now theology. <coughs> His father is big in it. Let me just read you. Oh, I still have a voice left. An interesting article. I'm running out of time. When Cruz says he wants to reclaim or restore America, he does not only have the Obama administration in mind, 
This agenda takes it much deeper into the American past. Cruz wants to restore the United States to what he believes in its original identity, a Christian nation. I repeat, which Christian nation? The one that been involved in a hundred, hundred, over a hundred wars? Or something else that I don't know about? A Christian nation that burned witches at the stake? Do you even realize some of the torture? Because you're not really, as an audience, turned on, for the most part, into the secret things of history that no one wants to talk about. Maybe I will someday. About the Christian torture in this country. If you didn't see things their way, according to their religious viewpoint, especially in the New England area, in the very early years, in the pioneering days that started before this country was established and even continued afterwards. Which Christian nation? I could go through hundreds of examples and point out to you it's not been very Christian-like. And once again, I repeat, thank God for his mercy. Thank God that he keeps his word. Because as a nation, we don't deserve it. And there's nothing that we can do as a nation, Christian or otherwise, that can meet to up with God's standard. Same as individuals. That's why we need his grace and mercy. But before he can bring the country back to its Christian roots, Cruz needs to prove that Christian ideas were indeed important to American founding. That is why he has David Barton on his side. For several decades, Barton has been a GOP activist with the political mission to make the United States a Christian nation again. He runs Keep the Promise, a multi-million dollar Cruz super PAC. He's one of Cruz's most trusted advisors. Barton is the founder and president of Wall Builders, a Christian ministry based in the hometown of Aledo, Texas. He writes books and hosts a radio television show designed to convince evangelicals and anyone else who will listen that America was once a Christian nation and needs to be one again. Barton's work is an important part of Cruz's larger theological and political campaign to take back America. If Barton can prove that the United States was once a Christian republic, then Cruz will have the historical argument he needs to sustain his narrative of American, of American decline. Cruz wants Americans to believe the country has fallen away from its spiritual founding and with God's help is the man who can bring it back. Anyone who has watched Cruz, what a sad, you really think about it, what a sad commentary on the preachers of this United States of America. We have to elect a politician to bring back the spiritual essence of this country. Preachers can't do it, obviously. What the hell are we preaching then? How ineffective it is what we're preaching. That we no longer can turn this world upside down. We need politicians to do it. You see how wrong that is, folks? Anyone who has watched Cruz in the Stump knows that he often references the important role that his father, traveling evangelist Raphael Cruz, has played in his life. During a 2012 sermon at the New Beginnings Church in Bedford, Texas, Raphael Cruz described his son's political campaign as direct fulfillment of biblical prophecy. The elder Cruz told the congregation that God would anoint Christian kings to preside over an end-time transfer of wealth from the wicked to the righteousness. The righteous, excuse me. After the sermon, Larry Hutch, the pastor of New Beginnings, claimed Cruz's recent election to the U.S. Senate was a sign that he was one of these kings. According to his father and Hutch, Ted Cruz is anointed by God to help Christians in their effort to go to the marketplace and occupy the land and take dominion over it. 
This end time transfer of wealth will relieve Christians of all financial woes, allowing true believers to ascend to a position of political and cultural power in which they can build a Christian civilization. When this Christian nation is in place or back in place, Jesus will, Jesus will return. You know, Christian was at its strongest. Christianity was at its strongest when it was under the persecution of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire came and went. Christianity marched on. True followers of Jesus Christ kept putting out the rightly right word of God. Yes, it would get twisted. Yes, it would take different turns. It became a corruption what the true rightly divided word of God was and what it reveals. But God somehow, because he does keep his promises to us and his son, has always redirected back. It always captured, not the many, but a few, to keep the message pure and strong about the wonderful situation that we have an opportunity and everyone that listens to the right word of God to respond to. And that is obviously the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Raphael Cruz and Larry Hutch preach a brand of evangelical theology called Seven Mountains Dominionism. They believe Christians must take dominion over seven aspects of culture, family, religion, education, media, entertainment, business, and government. The name of the movement comes from Isaiah 2.2, 2, which reads, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains. Talk about twisting that scripture. Barnes Christian nationalism is a product of the theological approach to culture. Back in 2011, Barnes said that if Christians were going to successfully take the culture, they would need to control these seven areas. If you can have these seven areas, or those seven areas, Barn told his listeners to his radio show, you can shape and control whatever takes place in nations, continents, and even the world. Seven Mountain Dominionism is the spiritual fuel that motors Cruz campaign for president. president. And of course, that's all wrapped up in the Dominion theology, as I mentioned earlier. What is the Dominion theology? It's a theocratic ideology that seeks to implement a nation governed by conservative Christians ruling over the rest of society based on their understanding of biblical law. Dominion theology is related to theonomy, though it does not necessarily advocate Mosaic law as the basis of government. Prominent adherents of Dominion theology are otherwise theologically diverse, including the Calvinist Christian Reconstructionism and the Charismatic Pentecostal Kingdom Now theology and a new apostolic Lictic Reformation. The term the Dominion theolo theology is applied primarily among non-mainstream Protestants in the United States. Some elements within the mainstream Christian right have been influenced by Dominion theology authors. Indeed, some writers have applied the term Dominionism more broadly to the mainstream Christian right, implicitly arguing Implicity, arguing that the movement is founded upon a theology that requires Christians to govern over non-Christians. Mainstream conservatives do not call themselves dominionists, and the uses have sparkled, spark, excuse me, considered controversy. The term dominion theology was derived from the King James Bible's rendering of Genesis 1.28, the passage in which God grants humanity dominion over the earth. And God blessed Adam and Eve, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the fowl, over the fowl of the air, and every other living creature upon the earth. In the late 1980s, seven prominent evangelical authors used the phrase dominion theology and other, and other terms such as dominionism to label a loose grouping of theological movements that made direct appeals to this passage in Genesis. Christians typically interpret this passage as as meaning that God gave humankind responsibility over the earth. Well, yeah, but they blew that. But, but the distinct aspect of dominion theology is that it is interpreted as a mandate for Christian stewardship in civil affairs no less than in other human matters.
Most of this con contemporary movements labeled Dominion Theology or Dominionism arose in the 1970s in religious movements reasserting aspects of Christian nationalism. Ideas for how to accomplish this very, this very, very, very doctrinated versions of Dominion Theology are sometimes called hard Dominionism, hard Dominionism or Theocratic Dominionism because they seek rel relatively authorian, theocratic or theonomic forms of government. Now, I don't want to bore you with all this false doctrine. So I'll skip over some of this stuff, but what about the Kingdom Now theology? Kingdom Now theology is a branch of Dominion theology which has the follow following within Pentecostalism. It attracted attention in the late 1980s. Kingdom Now Theology states that although Satan has been in control of the world since the fall, God is looking for people who will help him take back dominion. My friend, that will never happen. Only Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, will come back with judgment and take back dominion. Now, he has already took back dominion. Dominion of what? Death in the grave, as was promised. He took over dominion that sin had over us. But the work is not complete yet. He's still coming back with judgment. As he prophesied and preached himself about what he would do. And we're living closer than ever to that time, which it will happen. We can't take back this world's dominion and make it a Christian world, or even this country, a Christian nation. Our mission, our commission, our purpose is tell the world about what He did for us 2,000 years ago and prepare for His return, which is just around the corner when He finishes the job that was prophesied. Those who yield themselves to the authority of God's apostles and prophets will take control of the kingdom of this world, being defined as all social institutions, the kingdom of education, the kingdom of science, the kingdom of arts, blah, blah, blah. Kingdom now theology is influenced by the latter reign movement, and critics have connected it to the new apostolic reformation and fivefold ministry thinking, which is another false doctrine which I don't have time to get into. Let me skip over some of this because I'm running out of time. I spent more time on it than I should have. But I think you've got enough of it. In many ways, the minimum is a more political phenomenon than a theological one. It cuts across Christian denominations from stern austere sects to the signs and wonders cultures of modern megachurches. This might offend some. Think of it like political Islamism, which shapes the activism of a number of antagonistic fundamental movements, from the Sunnis to the Shiites in that part of the world. And that's exactly what it is. They don't want a religious establishment, but that's what they're asking for. That's what they're secretly trying to strive for with the purpose because they have twisted God's word about that we should take dominion over this world. And therefore, it's our commission to put people in political offices that will run and govern this country based on their theology. Now, I didn't get that deep into it. You can read it all for yourself. You can look it up. And you can do what you want with the information. But some of this Kingdom Now theology would have this country governed by the Old Testament principles of the law.
That's what we face, folks. We face a group of individuals and organizations that secretly want to make this a Christian nation again, which I claim it never was. It was a nation that became undivorced because of what Christ said and did. And he has a purpose for it, as he does all the lost tribes of Israel, including the one that's not lost, and that's Judah. All of it has end time ramifications, how all these tribes will come together and be an instrument and tool for God to use to fulfill all end time events, but eventually he will come back and finish the job and once and for all Satan and his minions will be taken out of the equation and Christ will rule and reign. <coughs> he will do it. Will he set up a structure that will include us? More than likely. But that's mostly speculation how that takes place. What's not speculation is he will rule and reign. He will have complete dominion. All our works to have that type of dominion will fall short. It's heresy. It's false doctrine. It's what's being peddled and you don't even realize it because you listen to some of the constitutional uh, stance, stances that Ted Cruz takes, and it sounds good, and some of them are. But there's a deeper agenda behind it. All you have to do is trace a person's background to dig into his, their roots to see that They want to establish a Christian viewpoint upon everyone in this country that will govern their lives, whether they accept Christianity or not, they will not have a choice. Now, there's been a few individuals throughout history that never had a choice. Jeremiah, at what we've been looking at lately, is one of those. But for the most part, you have a choice. Jesus Christ has not forced himself upon you. He'll draw you when he wants to draw you, but you still have to respond. It has to be a willing change of mind that would change your heart. And when that happens, you have no problem becoming a slave of his. And not the way slave is defined for most, in most dictionaries. This is not a slave because you had no choice. This is a slave because you made the choice. I'm not telling you how to vote. I care less. But at least know some of the guiding principles of these politicians that are bidding for president. And if you want to know the truth, all the choices. are sad cases, in my opinion, to be in such a position 
eventually as President of the United States. But then again, we've had that situation for many, 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 many years. Now, take heart. God's in control. God's in control. And we can see by our elected officials how he is directing these last days. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear what's happening. And I'll try to keep you informed based on what I see in God's word. How's that taking place as time marches on? I said to someone the other day, if it's Trump's time, then we know a battle axe is coming. If it's one of these other candidates, then he has something else in mind, which I'm not going to get into right now, but we'll see how this plays out. And you know, by the way, that rally that was supposed to take place on Friday evening, a Trump rally, and of course, move on and some Islamists and whatever, decided to interrupt that rally and protest. That's not really a protest. That is thugs trying to disrupt a rally. That's all that was. But the video they kept playing over and over and over. Did you notice that outside of that one black individual getting in a scuffle with the, the white person, that the same video they showed over and over is a bunch of Middle Eastern men jumping around thinking they accomplished something? Mark my words, if Trump gets in, a battle axe has come in the Middle East area of this world. Don't buy into the... He's going to be neutral. That's what he's saying now. Only time will tell. I don't pl claim to be a prophet. I just deliver prophetic understanding of what God's Word says concerning the prophecies. We know there will be a time where a battle axe will be in the position of this country's leadership that will make the decision that enough's enough, along with Israel, present-day Israel, in the Middle East. And it will wipe up, and for a short period of time we'll have peace because of the Psalm 83 war, but that will only be a short-lived peace situation we'll be in because the Gog Magog war will be just around the corner. Things are setting up that way, friends. This nation was never a Christian nation. This nation was a nation, because what Christ did, was a nation that now could be identified once again as the sons of the living God. It doesn't say that these sons of the living God would be perfect. It doesn't say that these sons of the living God would be Christian-like, according to the definitions that are out there, what a Christian should be like. It just says there are sons of the living God because what Christ did on that cross, who came to save sheep that were lost in the house of Israel, in the individual application and also in a nationalistic application. Don't be conned by all the terminology and false history that's being presented to, to try to lure you into voting for them because they could bring us back to the values that we once had. That's why I pointed out over a hundred official and unofficial wars, declared or undeclared wars, have taken place. About 105, really. If we're a Christian nation from the inception, we've been a poor example of it. 
if you just take a look at all the wars that have been involved in, in this country and outside this country. Tell me. We could claim maybe we love God, but how about loving one another? A commandment from Jesus Christ, I repeat. How do you blend the two, war and love, together? You can't, and I don't try to. I don't try to take that hypocritical stance. I know what the ideal is. But I even can, as an individual, live with that standard 24-7. I'll be the first one in a minute. That's why I need God's grace and mercy and His continuing removing of my sin on a daily basis. That's what He's promised to me and He's promised that to you. These Christians, they're trying to make this so-called a Christian nation again are full of it. They're lying to you. They're just trying to establish religion. And he rode the First Amendment away quicker than any liberal leftist will ever do. Now, you might agree with me or you might disagree with me. If you disagree with me, then research why you do disagree with me and dig into the facts. Like I said, we know what these candidates are like. No prize anywhere. But whoever gets in office, we'll see how God will use them to fulfill His word. And He will. That's the only thing that you can bank on. The only thing that can be trusted it is, is His word. Now, I went a lot longer than I expected. My voice lasted. But now I want to hear from you. Play a song.